Uh, right, so welcome to our uh, final talking with a uh, tutorial session of the Maximin conference. Uh, another group member, uh, Daniel Widowson Dan, will talk about pointwise distance distributions of periodic point sets. Over to you, Dan. Please. Yeah, so uh, maybe my, my talk will be slightly shorter than the others because I only have 18 slides. Maybe we'll save back time. But um, yeah, I suppose welcome. We'll start right at the start, even though I think everybody knows everything in the first couple of slides. I don't like to start in the middle. So uh, the introduction is here. We model our crystals with these periodic point sets that we've already seen. Um, essentially, you choose a basis. Uh, or three, in this case, two uh, basis vectors for a 2D point set, or in 3D, you'd have three basis vectors defining a parallel of hyped. And then inside there, you have some number of points. Um, so we can model real crystals in this way because, well, they, they, uh, they share this, this um, periodic nature. And we model atoms by the center of the uh, their positions for this sort of uh, more, what would you call it, mathematical description. And um, our goal is to, to take this representation of periodic sets and sort of funnel them through some sort of algorithm to get out a descriptor with certain properties that we find important. So Vitaly's introduced quite well um, why we care about some of these properties in specifically mostly uh, or entirely isometry invariance and continuity. So uh, the next slide is just some pictures that we've already seen, but to try to sum up why we care about specific things from our descriptor. Uh, so these, these top six periodic sets are all defined by very, very different motifs and unit cells, but all result in the exact same periodic set. And uh, if I haven't, if I hadn't have written this sentence, like even I might get confused by these sets just looking at them because it's not entirely obvious at first glance that they're all the same thing. But of course they are. They're all just the black square lattice uh, like this. Some are rotated, some are translated. But um, we call that's this set of um, set of operations that don't really change the periodic set isometries, roughly speaking. We really care about rigid motions, but we throw in uh, we throw in reflections essentially for convenience. I'll, I'll say that isometry is a more um, it's an easier concept to negotiate with mathematically than rigid motion. So that's kind of why we include it. But um, this is the motivation for something that's an isometry invariant, meaning if you have two periodic sets that are isometric to each other, then the output is exactly the same. And down here, we have the motivation for something that's continuous. We can take something like this, and then by extending the unit cell and moving one point, we've continuously deformed the structure, resulting in a similar structure because this, this movement wasn't very much, but it's discontinuously changed, say, the symmetry group or the volume of the reduced cell, which uh, is not a problem for symmetry groups. In fact, it's by design, uh, and it's the whole point. But uh, in another sense, if, if your notion of similarity between sets is, say, the bottleneck distance, which has already been introduced, which uh, is just the maximum distance that any point had to move under this perturbation, we can see that they're similar, and we want a measure of similarity that tells us they're similar without uh, Discontinu discontinuously changing the descriptor. So we want something that takes both into account. Um, something like density doesn't change at all under this, uh, under this displacement. Uh, it stays completely constant, which is not good because they're not exactly the same thing. We need a continuous kind of measure of similarity. So this is the direction we're trying to head in. And uh, with the motivation setup, we can pretty much just jump in to how we construct the point-wise distance distribution. And uh, this is the next few slides, I guess, are where questions will be important if you have them, because this is the whole point of the talk. So let's start with a periodic set, like the one we had earlier, three points in a random unit cell. And this is how we construct our PDD 
or point-wise distance distribution. So for each point in the motif, we're going to record the distances to its nearest neighbors. And what we get is a matrix. So we're going to create a matrix where it has one row for every motif point. And it doesn't matter which motif or unit cell we chose, to be honest. We could have even chosen an extended unit cell for now. But each, each row gets uh, one motif point. And in that row, we just list the distances to the points nearest neighbors. So in this case, I've picked on this point and it's, I've, I've uh, shown in the diagram distances to its five nearest neighbors. And I've just recorded those in order in the row. So this top row corresponds to this point I've picked on. And the other two rows correspond to the other two points. And you can see we measure distances outside the unit cell, not just inside. So um, we could record as many nearest neighbor distances as we want. We pick some number K and record up to that many neighbors. So we end up getting K columns and M rows, where M is the number of motif points. So what we have is a matrix of nearest neighbor distances. The reason I guess that we've uh, chosen to pick on distances between points is that they're by definition isometrically invariant. Uh, that's what isometry means. It means distance preserving transformation. So this is kind of a good place to look if you're looking for something that uh, is preserved when you start rotating or translating your structure. But there's some pretty clear issues with just this matrix. It's insensitively dependent on a few things that we have to fix. So probably the most obvious is the one I mentioned last here, which is that we can just choose a different order for our motif points and then the rows will be differently ordered, uh, which is a problem because the ordering of the motif points is clearly uh, means nothing, right? You could just choose any ordering. We want it to be independent of the ordering of the motif. But also, if we do pick an extension of the unit cell, of course, your representation has changed. The periodic set, set stays exactly the same but the number of rows we're going to have is gonna double up because well, before we had three points in the motif and now we have six. Uh, but note that the new rows will just be copies of the old ones because the new points we've included have the same environment as the, the previous three, right? Um, so what we're just gonna do is get uh, double the number of rows, but there'll be copies of the old ones. And um, we'll just, solve these problems essentially by plastering over them. So first let's apply a stable ordering to these rows so that we no longer have it dependent on the order of our motif. We can choose lexicographical ordering and that will be just fine. Uh, now, no matter which ordering you chose for the motif, if you lexicographically order after you uh, make this distance matrix, we'll end up with the same matrix. Right? And then to solve the other problem, we just collapse identical rows into one row and record a weight next to that row, which is proportional to the number of times it appeared, or you could say equal to the number of row appearances divided by the total number of motif points. So in this case, I took the matrix from before, ordered it lexicographically. So now this entry with 0.287 and then 0.452, which is the first two smallest values, appears first. And then afterwards, we collapse rows. In this case, there's no identical rows. The rows have to be completely identical to be collapsed. So since there are no identical rows, we don't collapse any rows, actually. We just uh, keep them as they are and give them each a weight of one third. Um, and that is quite simply how we construct the point-wise distance distribution for a K. So we could have chosen any K, but this is for K equals five. Um, and that's how you construct it for any set. So there's two more examples on the next slide. If there are no questions, you may interrupt by the way. Um, now would be a good time if, if I've glossed over anything that doesn't make sense or something. So um, here are two examples of point-wise distance distributions from some random sets I picked. So take this one up here. I create its PDD and I get two rows. That is, uh, hopefully you understand that it would have had three rows and then I collapsed two of them because they were the same. And why were they the same? 
uh, well, they were the same because this point right here, I don't know if you can see my cursor, hopefully you can. Uh, the point uh, on the sort of lower left here and the point on the upper right are symmetrically equivalent. That's to say that if you were standing at one point and looked around you, and then you stood at the other point and looked around you, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference other than you know, your orientation within the coordinate system. Isometrically and uh, symmetrically, they look identical to stand up. And that's why if you look at their nearest neighbor distances, you get the exact same list and hence they were collapsed into just one row. So we end up getting two rows in total, one with twice the weight. And you could probably tell by the numbers in the matrix, what numbers I chose for these points, what coordinates they were. These form a little right angle triangle uh, with side length 0.1, right? And this is root two divided by 10. So that's the distance across from uh, one point to the other in this little triangle. And then below it, there's a more, slightly more involved example of extended the unit cell and moved the point. So now the symmetry is broken and that's represented by the fact that all the rows are here now. We haven't collapsed any of them because they've all got unique nearest neighbor distances. Uh, this last row corresponds to the perturbed point. You can tell that because all the others have a distance of 0.1 to some neighbor and you can tell that should be the case for all of them except for this one. So that's how we construct a point-wise distance distribution. But uh, importantly, what are its properties that we know about and how do we compare these things? Because they're kind of useless if we can't use them to take a, a set and another set and com compare them. That is the whole point. So I'm gonna just uh, go through a list of properties of this PDD. The first two points should hopefully uh, be fairly obvious given the setup it would be kind of disappointing if it didn't fulfill these conditions so any two periodic sets that are isometric certainly have the exact same pdd which is one of our goals and that was by construction so that's good and once in the next few slides i introduce a proper way to compare pdds i.e metric with pds they're continuous when you perturb points in the bottleneck distance that is which i have a, a slide just briefly, uh, briefly with the equation, but yeah. Uh, the third point, in fact, I'll, I'll come back to this point. The, the last point here is that uh, it ended up being such that PDDs are very fast for computation and comparison, which is quite nice. Of course, once you compute a PDD, you can just store it. Um, you have this arbitrary, kind of arbitrary decision on K, but nicely. What's nice is that you can increase K and it doesn't change the previous values. So generally you compute a PDD and store it and then you never need to compute it again. Um, and it doesn't take very long to compute them or to compare two PDDs at all. You can, I mean, relatively speaking, there's, you know, it doesn't take very long to compare two densities relative, relatively speaking to everything else, but compared to say RMSD, we have a significant advantage on speed, which is quite nice. Um, and as for this third point about completeness and reconstructability, so um, what we know is that for most, uh, most uh, could be said to be in a mathematical sense, most sets are reconstructable from their PDD in two dimensions, uh, up to isometry, of course. Uh, and this class of, of uh, sets, distance generic, comprises most in that uh, in that the, I think the periodic sets that are not distance generic will make up like a measure zero part of the space. Meaning that if you have a set that's not distance generic, it's only an arbitrarily small perturbation away from being distance generic. So basically completeness does cover the whole space except for these degenerate cases. Um, you might think it's unfair to just say it works, except in the degenerate cases where it doesn't. But the point is that uh, these degenerate cases don't comprise that much of the input space uh, from a measure theory perspective, I suppose. In three dimensions, which is the one we care about, we can reconstruct given six conorms, which are a scalar products of the basis vectors, which is something we were looking at just a minute ago. Um, this is somewhat unfortunate, except um, it seems as if the PDD 
is practically speaking able to distinguish most crystals. And on top of this, uh, although I don't introduce it here, maybe I should have, uh, we're working on higher order PDDs, which essentially think of, a, think of it as a similar procedure to what we did above to construct the PDDs, except we include a fair bit more relative information about distances between points. Instead of having one row for each motif point, we have one row for each pair of motif points. And we can basically the PDD ends up containing a fair bit more information about how points are distributed. And it's our, um, I believe it's our conjecture that, that that will be complete in the distance generic sense. But um, for now, in three dimensions, you need this additional information of these six co-norms of the lattice to reconstruct. OK, so I think next is to introduce the Earth movers distance, which uh, is important because the whole goal is to uh, take, be able to take two periodic sets and essentially compare them. That's how you would continuously parameterize the space, let's say. Uh, so let's introduce a suitable, metric, a suitable metric to compare PDDs. And by suitable, really all I mean is uh, it has to be continuous within, with respect to the inputs, with respect to the bottleneck distance, which is how we're going to um, define the sort of natural, it's a natural measure, as it says here, of deviation between two periodic sets. Uh, if you understand this line, which I think people here are mathematically inclined, so maybe you do, that, that's good. But uh, if not, it's, it's something like the, if you try to transform one set into the other by a map, you have a map from one set to the other, uh, then, well, if you have two periodic sets, there are infinitely many maps between each other. And there is one of those maps where um, the distances that each point has to move, the distance from a point to its image is uh, minimized across all points, let's say. And then that is, the, the maximum distance that any point moves under uh, that map is called the bottleneck distance. So uh, maybe a better way of putting it would be for this example up here, the bottleneck distance will be this distance moved by this point. And for this one on the right, it would be uh, the distance from, uh, well, this, the largest distance moved by any of these points under perturbation. By the way, the bottleneck distance would be taken between one structure and another. So I'm talking about the bottleneck distance between this and this, right? So I'm not going to prove formally, I guess, that it's continuous in the bottleneck distance, but maybe give some intuition. And uh, if you know what continuity means formally, that's fine. But if not, this sentence should sum it up, basically. The small bottleneck distance between two periodic sets should result in small uh, PDD distance in the output. So I'm going to try and explain how the earth movers distance works with a more abstract analogy first, and then I'll try and relate it to our situation, or maybe you see where it's going as I go through this example. So the earth movers distance can be taken between two distributions, essentially, and this is what I mean by distribution. It's just uh, imagining we have two collections of weights and in our setting, all these weights will sum up to one as they do on the top here. This is one distribution of weights. And on the side, we have another distribution. Um, how I'm going to ask people to imagine this if they don't like the abstract version is with the earth movers analogy. So how I like to describe it in my head is we have piles of earth here on the top. Uh, some with more than others. This has four ninths of Earth and this has one ninth of the Earth. And on the left here are four buckets or holes and you have to fill these buckets with the Earth. Since the total height of all these things sum to one on the top and the side, each of them sum to one, we can perfectly fill these buckets on the left with the Earth. But uh, there's a catch that makes this into an actual mathematical problem. And that's that there's a cost from moving um, any earth from any pile to any bucket. So for example, moving from this big pile containing four ninths of the earth to this big bucket, which is four ninths of the volume, costs seven 
we could say it costs seven something per unit of movement. Not per unit of movement, it costs seven per unit of earth moved, right? So if I was to move four ninths into this bucket, all of it into this four ninths bucket, it would cost seven times four ninths. And the idea is that you can move from any pile into any bucket anywhere you like, as long as they all get filled. But what is the minimum cost strategy from moving the earth into the buckets? And in this case, I've tried to make it kind of obvious with this cost matrix. This cost matrix demonstrates what the cost is from moving from a pile to a bucket. The numbers have made it kind of obvious what the best strategy is. For example, like this one ninth pile over here has a, 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 an entry of zero down here, meaning it costs nothing to move it into this bucket. So that's pretty much the logical place to put it. Of course, given different distributions and different cost matrices, the strategy for moving could be the optimal strategy for moving, which is what we care about, could be very complicated. But the earth movers distance is the uh, cost of the optimal strategy. So in this case, we have this, where, uh, so this big bucket, uh, this big uh, pile of earth, uh, four ninths earth, was split amongst these two ninths, which are both quite low cost compared to the other two. This uh, over here was moved in over here at zero cost. And these all, all filled this uh, large hole. And hopefully you can see that the colors uh, sort of coded where each of these terms came from. So two ninths times 0 0.1, because I moved this pile of two ninths in here and that costs 0 0.1. So this sum of products, gives you what the earth movers distance is between the two distributions that we have. Um, so with that kind of abstract analogy out of the way, we will show how this relates to our PDDs and why it works. So here's a simple example of us comparing the two PDDs with the earth movers distance. So for us, the weights or the, uh, if you like, the height of the earth piles and the depths of the buckets come from these weights on the earth movers, uh, sorry, the PDD matrix, which, uh, you know, you probably saw coming because they sum to one, that makes sense. But to get the cost matrix, which is the crux of the situation, we have to compare rows of one PDD with the other. So in this case, Let's take, for example, this top left entry in the cost matrix, which is 0 0.4. That comes from us comparing the first row of this PDD with the first row of this PDD. And here I've compared them with L infinity, which is what we usually use. Uh, we could use other metrics. Um, in a sense, they should all give us roughly the same answer. But L infinity is quite nice on the numbers. It's quick and it's easy to prove continuity with. Not that we'll be doing that, but. Uh, if you do take the L infinity between the top rows of each one, you'll see it's 0.4. L infinity, by the way, means the maximum difference between those two rows. So here, 0.1 versus 0.5, there's a difference of 0.4, right? And the, the, that difference doesn't get any larger than 0.4 across any of the entries. The only entry that's not 0.4 is this one right here, the bottom left entry. And that comes from comparing the first row of this bottom PDD with the second row of this uh, top PDD here. And we'll see that when we compare the fourth entry, not, uh, 0 0.9055 versus 0 0.5, we get a difference of just over 0 0.4, which is where this cost comes from. And with that, cost matrix calculated by comparing the rows of the PDDs with each other, we get a suitable input for earth movers distance. In this case, the two sets are what I'd call not very similar and the cost matrix is not very interesting or enlightening, which is why I have the next example, which should hopefully be a bit better. So what happens when we actually have a match, let's say in a simple example, this one is, um, a little bit more involved. So these two sets on the left, we're now in 3D, which it doesn't really matter. These things work in n dimensions. 
that these two things on the left might look almost the same and they are almost the same, but they're not the same. I, I just took a random collection of points and then to get the other one, I perturbed each point by a small amount. And we get these two PDDs as a result. But the point is that each row in this top PDD is going to correspond quite strongly to some row in the other PDD. And the reason for that is we didn't change the periodic set very much. And so its first four nearest neighbors, you know, have similar distances. You can tell which point up here was supposed to correspond to which point down here just by looking at their nearest neighbor distances, comparing the vectors. And you get a smaller number than comparing it to any of the others. And that's represented in our cost matrix over here. Uh, so we have three very small entries on the diagonal and all the other entries, relatively speaking, are much bigger. So it's pretty obvious what the minimum cost strategy will be. It's going to tell us to take this row and move it into this row, right? And it's going to take, tell us to take this and transport it into this and so on. So the earth mover's distance is essentially finding the optimal strategy for pairing up rows with each other. And it does it all proportionally with the weights as well. So this takes into account the fact that you may have had multiple atoms in the motif which got collapsed because we doubled up their weights or at least gave them proportional weights. The earth mover's distance just take care of it, takes care of it. And notice that uh, this earth mover's distance we've got here is significantly smaller than the one before, 0.4 down to 0.03. Um, and that is because these are very, very similar sets. Note, by the way, this, uh, this, the unit of this will be, uh, well, if you're talking about crystals, it will be in angstroms, or, but it will be in whatever unit you choose for um, the, these uh, entries, right? So up here, if we have a unit one across the, uh, this is a simple unit cube, cubic lattice here, uh, then this, uh, the unit of this will be proportional to that, roughly speaking. So that's uh, what the units of these are. And you can see that roughly speaking, the earth movers distance has managed to uh, tell that these are similar sets by comparing the nearest neighbor distance lists of all the points. Okay, so I think, now we move to some of the results that we've managed to obtain because of our PDDs. So PDDs are relatively fast, which means we can take quite large data sets and uh, compare them pairwise even if we want to and see what sort of additional structure we can find or prove its worth by uh, taking a single crystal and seeing if it, we can find, say, the if we have a set of, I don't know, 6,000 crystals and we have one crystal from it, which, uh, which crystals are similar to this one? Can we find them quickly or not? And hopefully the PDD can help, right? So this has been our uh, dummy test data set for a long time now because it's quite large, somewhat homogenous. If you want an, an inhomogenous set, you could just use a big subset of the CSD, which is what we have been doing. But this is quite good to see... Um, if we can tell the difference between uh, generally different polymorphs, but with the same uh, construction from the same molecule in one energy landscape. So this T2 data set that's been mentioned earlier came from uh, one big simulation, which was intended to predict some new crystal structures. And out of 6,000 that were outputted by this algorithm, only five were actually synthesizable. But it turned out in this set of 6,000 that these synthesizable structures were repeated several times. And that wasn't so easy to see before because nobody wants to manually pass 6,000 crystals and uh, tools like RMSD aren't way too slow to do it pairwise. So I think we've managed to, ah, okay. Well, we can first talk about this, say, how PDD compares to a measure like density. So this is a portion of the what, was, what is called the energy density landscape. On the left, we, we saw the this up here is just a strip of it from uh, 1.2 to 
and I've labeled some structures uh, that lie at the bottom of this landscape. The point of this is the following. It's that take 5924 and 5916. If you open these two uh, beside each other in Mercury, they look like the exact same thing, which is, that, that's what they are. They're the same crystal, they're the same polymorph, but they're of course not literally identical which is why they are separated on the density landscape and on the energy landscape. So there's a difference in energy and a difference in density, but if you look at them, they're the same crystal. And their difference in density is enough so that other crystals, which are genuinely different, happen to lie in between them. And this is just because density is a single number. It's no hate on density, it's just, it's only one number. So if you try and describe all of a lot of crystals with it, you'll just get that some collapse on top of each other despite being different crystals. So on the right is show, uh, try, trying to show you how our PDD has um, separated out crystals by whether they're actually similar or genuinely different. What we've got is a minimum spanning tree. So briefly, the minimum spanning tree, each node will be one crystal and we can draw an edge from any crystal to any other and give it a weight equal to the PDD distance, because we can compare any two crystals. But the minimum spanning tree will take that complete graph and um, keep only the smallest edges, essentially. It gets rid of all cycles. It's uh, basically, um, it it's, uh, keeps only the edges, which will keep all the nodes connected, but have no cycles. And it minimizes the total edge lengths everywhere. So um, the idea is that if two crystals are close, they should end up close to each other on the tree because they'll be, if they are close, they'll have a small PDD distance or they'll have a small earth movers distance. And that's exactly what has happened. So this little cluster up here, 5916 through to 5924, all appear right next to each other. And there's a good reason for that. The, the, the IDs of these crystals probably give away that they're the same thing. And similarly, well, Importantly, uh, these four things, although they are the same crystal, essentially not identical, but similar, they are spread across this density landscape, which the density difference is not huge in actual real terms, but it's enough to make it just get all modeled up with all the other structures in this density strip. But uh, for us, 14 and 15 down here have, uh, form their own little area, as have these ones far away from each other. So we've actually, hopefully, in this case, managed, well, we have managed to separate out the actually genuinely different structures from each other. This red dot, by the way, uh, is the experimentally synthesized structure, and its closest match was 14 and 15. So it is a uh, correctly identified the closest simulated matches to the real crystal that was actually synthesized and measured. So we don't have to stop here. This is just a portion of T2 as a minimum spanning tree because it demonstrates the difference between uh, a, dense, a density measure and our PDD to measure dis dif distances between periodic sets. But we can go ahead and just plot all of T2 as a minimum spanning tree. Uh, by the way, the color on this on this minimum spanning tree for each node is the lattice energy, which is why we have dark spots where um, I've circled it. So in these circles are the five actually synthesized structures that were uh, a product of the T2 simulation. And you can see they lie in these hot spots of color, which is where energy was very low. So obviously that makes sense. The red dots were structures that were actually synthesized and measured, and the rest of them are simulated. But the point of these circles, which are not arbitrary circles, but actually mean something, is that all the nodes within one circle uh, essentially look exactly like this. So uh, inside this data set of 6,000 T2 structures, we managed to identify 13 T2 gamma structures, or structures that look exactly like T2 gamma, which uh, I had never seen before. I mean, I was given the closest simulated match, which comprised maybe one or maybe two uh, simulated crystals, 
but just uh, just by using our invariants, we were able to go ahead and find many more that lay hidden in the data set that I didn't know about, uh, which are all basically the same structure. And if you step outside this circle, what you'll get is simulated structures with obvious similarities, but kind of different. So in a sense, if you have, if you have a continuous a continuum from one structure to another, if you do have that continuum in your data set, it will probably find it along the, the tree somehow. Um, of course, if there are isolated islands in your data set, then it won't be able to find the continuous path because you've only given it so many crystals, but it will generally group by things that are similar and things that aren't uh, and separate things that aren't. And that happens on uh, in inside every single one of these little circles. We have um, several copies of the simulated structure and then you step outside and they get less and less similar. Uh, but T2 as a minimum spanning tree, we can go even higher than because, well, these invariants are quite fast. I would say that by our current methods, this, this doesn't take very long to produce. If you're willing to make some a couple of concessions, which aren't really concessions, they're just sort of uh, approximations that give huge speed ups, then you can get you can get this sort of tree in way less than way less than like 20 minutes or something. The times are a little bit difficult for me to remember, but our methods are relatively quick. So we can use them on even bigger data sets, for example, this, which we saw a portion of earlier. Uh, and in this case, as bef before paracetamol aspirin lay laid down here, this is a slightly different map, which was probably produced by slightly different parameters. But the idea is that there are many, many crystals on here and paracetamol and aspirin lay right next to each other, which is quite nice. But so do things uh, like here, we've got glycine and sucrose, somewhat related. And around here, you'll find other families of crystals which are also related to these things. Of course, a lot of crystals in the CSD are completely unique, meaning that you won't find them next to a similar structure because there are no similar structures. All that you can really do is put it somewhere on the tree, um, which is the best of a bad situation. So the node would have to be stuck sort of on the end somewhere in a minimum cost position, but it would still be pretty costly for the minimum spanning tree, if you like. We've got some other instances of similar, but not ex exactly the same structures over here. So these four things, uh, are all like long chain hydrocarbons, but they have extra or fewer uh, number of carbons in the chain. So if you didn't want to compare structures that were that had different molecules, you could just enforce that before comparing by PDDs as you might do with RMSD. But the nice thing about PDDs is that it's totally acceptable to compare structures with different numbers of atoms if you want to see if the PDD tells you anything about the similarity. And here it's decided that these should go together because the long chain hydrocarbons share, the atoms in those hydrocarbons share quite a few uh, nearest neighbor distances, although they're somewhat different. Importantly, PDD has managed to distinguish all the things that should be distinguished as well. So not only have we managed to make a tree this big, we've managed to use PDDs on our data sets, which are even bigger, possibly, although. PDD can't compare sets like this pairwise, it can take thousands and thousands of comparisons and uh, tell you whether they should be distinguished or not. And uh, after having done that, it turns out, I think that the PDD does distinguish all truly different uh, crystals in the CSD, at least the ones that we could, uh, that we could uh, make the PDDs for. There are some entries that it's a little bit difficult to negotiate with. Um, but I think that is uh, roughly the end of what I have to say. Thank you very much, Dan. Let us uh, thank Dan first for his presentation. Okay, so it's uh, nearly noon um, in UK. I'll 